in the brain is the most complex organ, and their connections are also the most complicated ones, right? So, uh, and my long-term interest was always trying to understand neuronal communications, and and therefore this complexity raises challenges for us to understand. And one of the ways I think, and this is what we are doing right now, too, was to developing tools trying to help ourselves and also can help the community, other scientists, other neuroscientists to understand the neuronal communication. Because these communications are really rapid, right? So the cells have this sort of uh, unique connection and many different types. So the challenge is, I think, is just to develop better tools to help us. And therefore we are focusing on a very big important aspect of our research was trying to not just doing research itself but rather than developing tool as a part of the research trying to figure out how neurons communicate with each other what's up everyone welcome to simulation i'm your host alan sakian we are in the beautiful beijing china at peking University. We are now going to be talking about neurobiology. We have Dr. Yulong Li joining us on the show. How are you? Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Sure. Really appreciate it. I'm also very grateful to Kirill Piatkevich for introducing us and making this happen and for you and your lab in the life sciences department here for helping partner with simulation for these great content that we're going to have together while we're in Well, city. it's a unique opportunity for us too. Thank you, thank you. And hopefully we can help be a catalyst for greater collaboration amongst US, China, hopefully. Well, we hope to. Yes. For those that don't know, Yulong's background. He is the principal investigator at the School of Life Sciences at Peking University, affiliated with the PKU McGovern Brain Research Institute. He's founder of the Lee Research Lab, which has about 30 undergraduate and PhD students studying cutting edge neurobiology. And you can find the links in the bio below, yulonglilab.org, as well as the Twitter and LinkedIn profiles. Okay, Yulong, let's start things off with one of our favorite questions we love asking our guests. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? Well, interesting you ask. It's you know, if you ask me two years ago, I thought the world will be, you know, better and better in terms of collaboration, uh, you know, uh, helping each other. But right now it's an interesting time. But in the long run, I think the work will still, you know, will be better in a way that, uh, you know, people's life quality will improve uh, throughout the world. We've been on that upward trajectory of life quality around the world improving, which has been great. And similarly, we've also now have the democratization of all of the exponential technologies. What would you say is some key principle to embody as we move into the exponential technology age? Uh, well, I think fundamental research certainly will help. So, for example, you know, the deep learning, the AI that has been popular, but they are, I think they are rooted from the uh, fundamental research, the breakthroughs. And likewise, uh, uh, for human health, the medicine that we have been developing, they are also rooted from the generations or years, years of fundamental researches. I like that. So a strong first principle on fundamental research for health and for deep learning, for pursuing the upgrades in our world. I like that a lot. How about your journey? Who were you growing up? Where were you born? I, I was born uh, in, in uh, Fujian province, China, in the south part of uh, mainland China. And then uh, I, uh, I spent my elementary school uh, junior high school and senior high school there until I, uh, uh, in my college year, I went to Beijing and studied in fact here uh, for my uh, bachelor degree. 
And how did you figure out when you were young that you wanted to pursue science, technology? How did you know? Well, I, I like technology. I remember when I was young uh, in, for example, in elementary school in my fourth year, our school actually have the first computer that for me to play. And I made some programs. In fact, I was very interested in programming. And, uh, and in high school, I was also interested about chemistry. Uh, and when I, at the time of uh, trying to get to college, in fact, my first choice was trying to study computer science. Uh, in 1996, but I failed to, you know, uh, get into the class just because my score is just not good enough for my province, and I accidentally uh, got into the life sciences. Interesting. So yeah, even the funny moment of pursuing computer science and not getting in for that got you into life sciences, which you are now principal investigator of. So yeah, <laughs> I enjoy doing that. I think my brain is plastic enough. <laughs> okay, so then, um, so then how did you pick up what you wanted to do here at, at Peking University and then how did you make this move to pursue the PhD at Duke University in the United States? Tell us about those years. So, uh, again, I, you know, even though I was not in the computer science department, uh, I was in you know, life sciences, and at that time, my major was uh, uh, biophysics and physiology. So I like science in general. Uh, then, uh, after the bachelor school's training, I have the choices of uh, further of my, further my education or you know find jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, I was you know before I graduate, I was looking around just to see if I'm sort of uh, securing a job with my bachelor degree, what is that going to be? And I found that uh, most of the jobs are like salesmen, which is, for, you know, retrospective might not be bad. But uh, at that time I thought, hmm, that might not fit with my interest. And uh, I was also thinking about uh, going to grad school in Beijing University, PKU, uh, uh, at that time. Uh, but mainly, uh, the, uh, the Beijing University, uh, at least in the past, was more focusing on teaching. So it's a teaching university, unlike right now we are trying to build a world-class research universities. Mm. So uh, mm. for a, a person who is interested about science and research, at that time I feel you know, uh, probably I could have better mm. training opportunities abroad, and that's how I applying uh, uh, grad schools in the States. And I was interested about physiology, mm -hmm. neurophysiology, you know, how the neurons talk to each other. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when I was applying for grad school in my undergraduate years, I was just only focusing on neurobiology because I thought that's so cool. The brain is the most complex organ in the world, and still now. Mm -hmm. And uh, understand how you work is just really interesting and also understand the brain is sort of a journey to understand ourselves because yes. we use our brain to you know to talk to communicate and you know this is the the, the, the most important organ probably in uh, in our body maybe even most important discovery for us in the universe one mm. of them yeah yeah, yeah. my my colleague will agree with you yeah but you uh, i tend to be uh, more politically correct, I don't say anything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh yes, uh, and, and surely uh, quantum mechanics will have a, a, a very big uh, role, this theory of everything with general relativity, figuring that out, figuring out the brain. These things have big roles in understanding ourselves and sustainable building of a future um, for us. Um, how about where did where did it come up for you that you wanted to do neurophysiology? Like, how did that end up being something that you were like, hmm, I want to know about that? Well, I went to grad school uh, at Duke University, very good university and good program. Okay, uh, I have the opportunity to do rotations, and um, 
you know, including in the labs of neurogenetics, uh, cellular neuroscience, and the, the sort of experiments I do there, I, it's just not as exciting at that time for me to feel. Uh, I just feel neurophysiology is most exciting because at that time we can poke electrode to the neuronal cells, mm -hmm. and when this neuron get you know, activated, they will generate action potentials, and then you can really in real time seeing the waveform of action potential generation in the oscilloscope or in your computer screens, as if you are just really talking to those neurons. And we are to the neurogenetics lab, that, uh, which is a really good lab, but you know, we, at that time, uh, we use the neurogenetic techniques, so we generate special genetic modified mice, no cows, but it will just take uh, like two years for you to really know the phenotype and knowing what happened if you eliminate this is very important gene for the mice. And probably I'm just not patient enough to wait for this uh, period of time. This is a longitudinal study. You're trying to see if you eliminate a gene, what happens over years to this? Because of the way to remove this gene, knocking out this gene takes time. And you know to generate this uh, Genetic modified mice takes time, and the mice, you know, if you want to start, you know, they are in their adulthood, it takes time to grow, right? So, so it, it takes time. And for the cell biology at that time, you know, I just feel, again, uh, using the technique of immunostaining, knowing, you know, in a fixed cell what happened. But I, I was just more excited about, in real time, how neurons talk to each other. And in fact, that's also related to my current work and in my, PA, uh, my postdoc work and my current lab's work. We want to study the real time, you know, and how neurons talk to each other. And I think this is, a, you know, very challenging but very interesting and important. Yeah, we'll get into neurotransmission, we'll get into all of that neuromodulation. Um, so then what was the, um, the PhD on and then what was the postdoc work at Stanford on? So my PhD I worked with uh, Dr. George Oxton uh, and I was using, mainly using a unique uh, animal organism called Squid. And in fact I spent quite some time in the marine biology lab in Woods Hall. Um, uh, where we use the fresh Squid and Squid it's a really unique creature where it has these giant neurons. Mm. Okay. Well, you know, a very famous Nobel laureate, Hopkins Huxley, uh, using SCREE to really understand the molecular, the mechanism of so-called action potentials. Mm. But this giant SCREE neurons also has a giant synapse. Well, How they big are we talking this neuron compared to like a human neuron? Probably a thousand times bigger, a thousand times or bigger. even bigger, wow. right, because the the diameter of that neuron is the the axons is uh, let's see, uh, well it's been some time, but it like, can be f 500 micron. Wow! Right? But the the that's just the diameter, right? Yeah, and yeah. in our brain, our neuron in the brain, excitatory neurons, their axon usually is one micron. Yeah. So uh, we are talking about using this giant neuron and giant synapse. They have this so-called <laughs> special structure called synapse the, where the, the transmitter has been released. And because this neuron is big, historically clever scientists figure out ways that you can poke electro into these big neurons and try to understand how they react, how they talk to each other. And my PhD thesis was using this nature's gift to study the neuronal communication with these giant <laughs> nerve fibers, where we can poke four electrodes, two in a presynaptic neuron, the neuron that is sending the information to the downstream postsynaptic neuron, which also has two electrodes. And because of these uh, electrodes can amplify the teeny tiny current that generate from those neurons, and then you can really read out what happened you know, during when those neurons are talking to each other. Uh, yeah, so, so that was a really unique uh, experience. And also because of this uh, marine biology lab where we use the squid, we also have a quite a number of neighboring labs using the gifts of nature, different 
gifts of nature. I like the way you put that. There are, there are ways that nature has made it easier for us to study biology and neuroscience that if we can find those places and study it there, it can give us better insights into how to study it in our own bodies. Right, so, so the gifts of nature, so that was judicity truth chosen by scientists, you know, different uh, animal model systems, including not just in the neuro, uh, neural system, but also during development. For example, you can use the sea urchins there to study the development, and you can start, you can use the goldfish to study the how the auditory pathway uh, integration, because it turns out the goldfish has this giant also neurons that integrate these auditory inputs to elicit some escape behaviors. And uh, so that was a sort of interesting in a way, just seeing how people were really uh, using different sort of uh, 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 model systems uh, to study uh, their favorite questions. And also, uh, frequently, the fundamental understanding that you obtain using squid using goldfish, sea urchin, that turns out to be conserved throughout species, including in human cells. And, but because of nature's gift, their unique structure, unique size, or their simplicity of anatomy, really allow us much easier to probe their secrets. Then one can use those known principles derived from those simple elegant systems trying to understand in a more complex uh, organisms like in, including in human, uh, in human diseases. And I will also say, just to elaborate a little bit more, mm -hmm. even if sometimes you found the principles derived from squid, from sea urchin as I mentioned, are not conserved to mammals, to humans. Mm -hmm. But it can still provide interesting diversity. For example, how really nature solved the problem, you know, to enable vision, right? Even if the maybe the squid's eyes are different than humans, but the the principle after you really understood understanding that, then can help you to appreciate how nature used diversified mechanism to solve the same problem, for example, to detect in light. And, and sometimes you can also find out that the same principle maybe was not using in the visual system, but it might use other sensory system. So the, the molecular aspect sometimes still conserve, even though the, the system is different. Okay. When you're giving the example of these nature's gifts and how they can you can find potentially neurons a thousand times the size of a human neurons for me it was kind of funny beginning to yeah start thinking about where all are all these nature gifts and how do we start understanding them better um, and scientifically researching them but also it came up this idea that you're a neuron and I'm a neuron and our words are the neurotransmission <laughs> what well, probably it's probably more complicated than that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's just, it's a, it was an interesting analogy that, that came to mind. Um, how about what was going on then for the cutting edge tools for understanding, mapping that neuromodulation, that neural activity, but also you said, you know, uh, I'm trying to envision here, you know, you guys having these two electrodes, four on two on each neuron there, and also trying to see what's happening in the synapse, trying to see what is actually going on with the neurotransmission. How were you, uh, how were you visualizing that? How are you actually being able to record it and learn from it? Well, the most classical approaches people develop that probably is more than 50 years old is using the glass electrode as I mentioned, where you can poke those electro, then electro has these teeny tiny tips. So when you are poking the electro into the neuronal cells, hoping that the cells are still healthy and has teeny tiny hole, but not damaged. And that you are connecting the, the, the cells 
and with the glass electrode and where you also have a glass electrode that that you, you insert an uh, amplifier that can amplify to the current that are leaking out through the cell okay and then then the way to understand neuronal communication is then you can record those teeny tiny currents that was generated to, uh, when this neuron receiving the the uh, presynaptic input receiving the input from the sender cells that's the most classical uh, uh, approach which is still being used uh, one of the challenging part is you need to be really skillful and also you better to have that animal or that neuron to be sitting still right because this glass electrodes are so delicate dedicate you know just since I'm moving I just scratching the uh, cells membrane the cell yeah. will just die yeah. and also the super of that approaches you know you only can recall most likely one cell a time so it's lower soup yeah which is now in the hundreds of neurons at a time hope as well so uh, so imaging in that regard that uh, will be useful because uh, if you have a spatial resolution, you can in parallel just like this video, you can just take an image of what happened. You can see in the scenes. And in fact, around that time, people have already generated uh, uh, dyes to try to look at neuronal communication. Yes. There's a special dye called ethan dye that is being used in the field. And this ethan dye has this unique property that once it get incorporated into the membrane, you will be become frozen. So some clever scientists then they just pull those dye outside of the cell and then stimulate those neurons. And neurons use those vesicles to release transmitter. But once the vesicle being released, you will merge with the surface membrane. And therefore the dye will just sort of attach mm. to it. And after the transmitter being released, neurons also use this so called endocytosis or internalization process will take on the dye and therefore this dye will just be this artificial dye that it will just be taking up into the vesicle and what you do is you just wash out the rest of the plus membrane dye you only retain the dye in those vesicles that contain transmitters and then you can just use the camera to look at how those dyes that it's been released. The fluorescing? Uh, the fluorescence uh, generated from those dyes. In different colors? It could, different could, could be in different colors. And that's been you know, a powerful way to, again, using image methods to look at how the transmitter been released. But you are actually not exactly looking at the transmitters, but looking at uh, the dye as a pseudo transmitter. Yeah. And similar pr principle has also been extended to uh, using a, a green fluorescent protein, the yes. so-called GIP, and you can take advantage of some GIP has a unique pH sensitivity, and therefore you can engineer this genetic encoded protein to target to those teeny tiny vesicle contained transmitters. And this vesicle it is actually known to be very acidic because they contain the protons, the, those, those energy currency to generate the, uh, to load those transmitters. And therefore, this GIP, if they are not being released or uh, get in touch with external world, they will be dimmed because they are quenched by this acidic environment. But once you really fuse with the plus membrane, the outside world is pH neutral, and then the GIP will just be bright and you can just see the signal, mm. frozen signal increase. Mm -hmm. So that's also been used. And those are all uh, efforts people are trying to, you know, uh, complement the uh, glass electro or the electrophysiology methods trying to understand how neurons talk to each other. Yeah, and expansion microscopy is also a big one. Uh, expansion microscopy uh, pioneered by my friend Ed Boyd in MIT that's a, that's a different way, not just to look at neuronal communication in real time, but instead, I think mainly, but also powerful, in a way to look at how 
neuron connect with each other in structure yes. because of the as I mentioned the neuronal con connections are through this unique structure called synapse and neurons are teeny tiny in our brain so the expansion microscopy where the, uh, at Boyden was developing was really you know enlarge the size of those uh, neurons glial cells well maintain maintaining their morphology and their geometry and therefore it will allow one to visualize which neuron connects to which neuron and helping us to uh, build a blueprint of understanding the neuronal kinetomics and it can also be combined with some special molecular markers so we not only know the neuronal morphology but we also know which type of neuron they, they might be that they sort of uh, secret glutamate, secret GABA or mm. secret dopamine. Yeah. And then how about the how about the transition for the postdoc work at Stanford? You know, how did you went to the other coast? You were able to explore California, you were able to see that. And what were you doing there? So uh, interesting. So uh, I, I uh, went to Stanford for postdoc was also a little bit by Aston. So uh, I was uh, attending a Society of Neuroscience meeting when I was a grad student. And uh, I was presenting a poster if, poster, if I remember correctly. And my postdoc advisor, uh, uh, Dick Chen, or Richard Chen, uh, he was a professor at Stanford at that time. He was just passing by my poster. And of course, I, being a, a grad student, I know his work. And, uh, and I like his work, and so he was just passing by my poster. So I, I actually, I think he just like stared at my poster for like 10 seconds or 15 seconds, about to leave. And I was jumping out of the crowd, grabbing <laughs> and just uh, having some thoughts about, you know, trying to talk to him and maybe impress him and seeking some uh, uh, postdoctoral position uh, opportunities. And, and Dick was kind enough, and uh, so he he um, he was not offended by my rudeness, and uh, so uh, actually I got to talk to him. I'm and envisioning uh, you jumping out of the crowd, eh? Hey, hey, grabbing him. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, I could be more violent, all right. Yeah. Uh, so so again, Dick was very generous and nice, and in a way, uh, so we talked, and then he. In, in invited me uh, to uh, interview at Stanford and then uh, after interview he actually gave me the offer and in fact uh, Dick lab is the only lab I interview and wow. and, and I decided to I like the lab I decided to go and uh, so I went to Stanford and uh, worked with him and uh, um, also actually trying to understand more how neuronal communication occurs what's the um, molecular mechanism and how to visualize uh, just following what I said before this communication. Yeah. And then how about then the transition back to Peking University to be the principal investigator here in the life sciences? How did that happen? Uh, well, being a postdoc for quite some time, you know, postdoc is a temporary job, right? So uh, uh, I think uh, both uh, uh, my wife and I, we are both, you know, sci scientists. We were both poster at Stanford at that time. So we were thinking about, uh, you know, after postdoc training, and, and what would be the next move, right? Uh, uh, we are both are still very into research, into trying to understand how things work, and uh, uh, I. I was also thinking about jobs in the States, which I actually happen to have some uh, faculty job uh, offers. And also at that time, also by accident uh, or coincidence, that uh, my uh, PhD advisor was hosting one of the symposium in an international biophysics meeting in China, in Beijing. So he wrote to me, you know, knowing that I was working on some aspect of uh, research in neuronal communication and inquiring me whether I was interested in attending the, the symposium he's organizing in, in Beijing and of course not carrying my flight 
uh, flight fares. Okay, uh, but uh, but could sort of uh, cover my uh, lounging and you know with with the uh, uh, the the conference uh, the conference uh, registration fee, mm. and just you know because I was in Beijing uh, studying for quite some time and haven't been back for some time, so I was uh, I was thinking oh that's a you know good opportunity just to you know uh, visiting. Beijing and you know uh, just check things out yeah and uh, since I was an undergraduate student in Beijing and Beijing University Peking University so I was uh, inquiry uh, some of the uh, faculties here and just uh, thinking about you know how is the uh, uh, the university doing and how is the life sciences research and in fact I also got good uh, encouragement uh, from uh, my uh, good, uh, I would say mentor uh, Li Qingluo, uh, uh Stanford faculty that uh, I collaborated with and uh, so uh, it, it turns out that my trip uh, to Beijing then become uh, both attending for the uh, the conference that I was giving talk but also I arranged in a way that uh, I visiting back uh, Peking University uh, and uh, giving a job talk and uh, I guess that job talk went well so I got a job offer mm. from Peking University and 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 uh, I think we we were debating because we were been uh, in the States for like close to 11 years and um, and also there's good science there we are we are we were familiar with the uh, funding system you know mm -hmm. how to setting our labs how to yeah. you know teach in English but I, on the other hand, I, th I was thinking about the uh, the, uh, the opportunities here. I, f I feel that this is also a, a unique opportunity where you can uh, get into a um, society and into a, a university where there's this ra rapid uh, sort of a change or rise yes. in terms of the academic research accompanying the economic booming. Yes. And uh, comparing with the states, uh, even though the I would say the derivative, the increase rate is higher than the states, but the total uh, w uh, mass of the good scientists or the or the preparation for the good research are still uh, tiny by comparison with the states. And therefore, being in a society here, if you could make a positive. Uh, progress that you potentially could have uh, I think larger impact and, uh, and, and that is uh, one of the incentives and the other incentive was uh, I think we have uh, quite good students because uh, 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 I was a student here and we also have uh, uh, good uh, uh, grant support uh, mm -hmm. uh, because you know in uh, Globally, around around that time, because of the uh, the financial downturn, uh, starting from 2008, uh, that actually was causing quite some troubles uh, for scientists as well. Mm -hmm. and, and I feel that a lot of scientists, including ones in the states and uh, some other places, uh, just because of the economic downturn, they are just more spending time uh, trying to. Uh, really secure funding to keep their lab alive uh, instead of focusing on uh, trying to put thoughts and efforts into research and into uh, making research progress and and uh, in Beijing potentially uh, it could provide this unique opportunity uh, so that was my thought and also I would say part of it just being naive okay and I, because you know, in fact, I have no, I, you know, I have not been back for, you know, more than ten years. I actually, I don't know exactly how this funding system works, <laughs> how to write grants in Chinese, and uh, but I was, I'm just naive enough and uh, taking a risk, and I thought maybe since we'll just work out, okay, uh, and. So, and my students, they don't know that, right? So they just you know, naively, you know, work with me, and then maybe thinking I'm just really uh, figure all the things out. But I was still 
sort of uh, trying yeah. to sort things out as well. Yeah. So the the factors of the the big university growth plus the big economic growth plus you being just naive enough to be like, I'll figure out how to write grants in Chinese out in the back in Beijing and figure that out. So, so you take this role and then you started introducing us to this. And I really like how you put it because it's important to get behind the eyes of these principal investigators or these lab directors because in many ways the, the, the students that are coming in to work in the lab are, hey look, equipment, hey look, we can conduct our science, no problem. But get behind the eyes of you who had to put together all of the grant applications, all of the funding to be able to buy the equipment to make conducting the science easy. So there's a lot of nuance in this operational process. Will you teach us about what that's been like for you? Uh, interesting. So in fact, when I was in grad school and as a postdoc, I was both, I was in both relative sort of established faculty lab. So I myself did not witness how a lab start from scratch. So uh, so that's actually in fact a lot of learning curves for me. Just and also in a environment in Beijing which I I did not get my PhD training and my postdoc training so there there are quite a lot of uh, things that especially at the beginning did not go well uh, I remember like like uh, in the first two years that once you know yet you know uh, some of our cells get contaminated you know and I was talking to myself again the students are all good but they are lacking experience, and then there's just there's a lot of nitty gritty details, both of in terms of equipment, lab skills, you know, be careful, you know, just that a lot of things to work on. And I was talking to myself, I was like, oh my goodness, I cannot make it here because you know, there's just nothing works, right? So, so, um, but I guess you know, since eventually work out, and I I think I I have good students, and I. Really think that they are fearless or mm. naive. Okay, <laughs> so they are fearless. They they work with me. Uh, 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 they uh, you know. Uh, so, so you know, even though uh, we met a lot of troubles, you know, because we are doing research. Right? If you think about research, research, right? Mm. This is the common thing that just a lot of uh, failures. But I think uh, they are. And my students, they are energetic, and uh, and in a way, we also have good uh, university support. Um, uh, we already have a good uh, critical mass of good scientists, and who uh, um, some of them are more senior than me, but uh, a lot, of, a lot of them they have the similar, they they are similar age, and then we shared our experience, and then we help each others, and so we got lots of support. And in fact, um, at least initially I did not uh, put a lot of efforts into writing grants but trying to sort things out just to you know, eliminate the contamination problem for the yeah. cell. Yeah. Yeah, the molecular biology doesn't work problem. You know, the, the camera is just broken problem. You know. mm -hmm. So I was more focusing on that. Mm -hmm. And then how did you end up figuring out the vision of being this principal investigator in life sciences. What do you, like, you know, biology being the code of life and there's so much complexity across all of it. Neuroscience, we were talking about the complexity of the brain and as such an incredible organ for us to understand. How do you figure out the vision? How do you figure out where to allocate resources? How do you figure all this out? So, uh, indeed, um in the brain is the most complex organ, and their connections are also the most complicated ones, right? So, uh, and uh, my long-term interest was always trying to understand neuronal communications, and and therefore this complexity raises challenges for us to understand. And one of the ways I think, and this is what we are doing right now, too, was to developing tools trying to help ourselves and also can 
help the community, other scientists, other neuroscientists to understand the neuronal communication. Because these communications are really rapid, right? So the cells have this sort of uh, unique connection and many different types. So the challenge is, I think, is just to develop better tools to help us. And therefore, we are focusing on a very big, important aspect of our research was trying to not just doing research itself, but rather than developing tool as a part of the research, trying to figure out how neurons communicate with each other. And one of the ways just to follow our previous conversation was trying to developing tools that can enable parallel detection or enable detection with spatial resolution. Mm. And that relies, you know, as most of you all are aware of imaging, right? The videos that has this sort of uh, spatial resolution. Mm. And also, if one work the things from, from a different angle, because the neurons are in the brain are so complex, there are so many different types. If we can figure out a way to label those neurons with specificity, emit light, then in the dark we can just see those lights and that can help us. And mm -hmm. one of the best way to label those cells with specificity is to again rely on nature's principle, nature's gift. That's using the DNA using those sort of uh, DNA inside the cell to encode those labels and using the genetic program inside those cells to turn on those light, turn on those labels in a specific cell type. Okay. Mm -hmm. In fact, this principle has already been used uh, quite some time by different scientists in the field not just for neuroscience, but also for development. Right? So then the, the, tr the challenge will be if you want to develop this sort of uh, so-called genetic encoded ones that you can put those label in the DNA. And you also want to develop something that will emit light. Right? Then how do you make those things sensitive to the secret language Neuron communicate with each other. Right? Neuron release different chemicals to activate their downstream targets. So then the question becomes: How do you design a way to pull those special protein, which are genetic encoded, encoded by DNA, which so the emit light, so you can borrow from, for example, uh, jellyfish has this green force protein or borrow from fireflies which they have this luciferase which will emit light and but you want to make them also not only just emit light but also emit light only in the presence of these secret neurochemicals mm. those individual mm -hmm. cells mm -hmm. secret right and so that's what we were working on uh, uh, when I was setting up my lab and uh, so one more time to see if we get this straight so then it's the engineering of the protein which then goes into the neuron which then is able to enable the neuron to s for if s to be able to showcase what uh, which um, neurochemicals are coming and then it's you can detect yeah and and it's through an uh, a fluorescence Right. process and it can be a specific color of fluorescence for a specific neuro right. chemical. Different colors or different light intensity, right? And different uh, intensities. Uh, fluorescence is one way. The other one, uh, luciferase, is not fluorescence but it's a sort of bioilluminance. It's using this chemical energy to generate light. So the difference between fluorescence and bioilluminance are, are the fluorescence required excitation light and then they usually they will emit a longer wavelength of light. That's for instance. Mm -hmm. The bioilluminescence uh, from fireflies, right? We don't use light to illuminate those fireflies, but the fireflies in the dark, they will just emit light because they use those 
chemical energies that we just through chemical reaction catalyzed by this luciferase, this enzyme that we just emit photons. How do you get the neuron to not reject the genetically engineered protein? So uh, that has already been worked out uh, by many others it in the past. But it always works now? The neuron never rejects now? Uh, there, are, there are different ways uh, we are using this uh, um, uh, model organisms that there's this genetic techniques has already been worked out by many scientists. So so you okay. can you can okay. specifically design uh, genetic tools to allow fire, uh, flies, fruit flies, or zebra fish or uh, mice to express this piece of DNA. Well, non toxic DNA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Getting past the immune response is critical. And okay, and now it's um, about being able to map neural communication using these techniques. So what? So then, at the lab, then wh how how are you working by with the different undergraduate and PhD students? How is there some sort of a lab communication that you do for? figuring out where to understand neural communication, what resources are going into which of the buckets? Well, it depends on at which stage. So for the initial stage, for example, we are just scratching our heads, are just trying to see, for example, the principle I mentioned that we are trying to develop, developing this genetic encoded sensors that can express in the cells. Okay. We, we don't have anything working yet, so so we, we have a group of students uh, that really focus in just trying to uh, test, you know. Again, we also take advantage of nature's gift, harness how nature detects those neurochemicals, okay. Mm -hmm. And for example, we hijacking or tap into nature's so-called receptors. It turns out nature have a different receptors sensing those neurochemicals like dopamine or acetylcholine or glutamine. And then we really rely on nature's designs, this molecule. Once they interact with or uh, receiving the message, these chemicals, they will undergo some conformational change. This uh, structure will be changed. And we were painstakingly testing if we put a light emitting green fluorescent protein there. Maybe these structural changes can lead to the ability to emit light change. So at the beginning it was just, you know, sort of slow, tedious, and, and we were really focusing on that. Uh, after five or six years after we actually are pretty good at this, we figure out some generic ways that we can make this to work and we actually figure out the ways that can make it emit not just green light but you know red light, you know, other lines. Okay? And we also figure out through our optimization that uh, we can uh, uh, that uh, emit more lights, bright lights rather yeah. than very dim lights. Yes. And uh, therefore the, the lab now is different than at the beginning because uh, once we have uh, in the through the experiments, we figure those things out. The lab now we are sort of divided in a set of uh, different questions that we ask using different sensors we mm. that we design and develop. We not only have those tools that we distribute to some other fellow scientists, but we also use these first available tools and put them in the brain, for example, in fruit flies' brain and just trying to decode how the fruit fly, when they sense flower, banana, mm -hmm. what happened to their brain. Yes. And there are neurochemical, important neurochemical, and interesting enough, fruit fly share a lot of common important neurochemicals, just like humans, like so ser serotonin. In, they in also a way, it's similar to when we see a banana, we get some sort of excitement happens right. as well. Right. They, you are, they have different neural anatomy, but you know, through presumably natural selection, they are also very sensitive mm. to their 
banana odor, right? Yes. Because there's a there's a source of food, right? So yes. they so they evolved to detect it with sensitivity, right? So then we can look at, for example, what happened with their fruit flies serotonin level, uh -huh. and because we have the tools that we can really look at where it will be released and how is it related to their sort of uh, physiology function. In fact, before us, you know, people already know that the serotonin is a very important neurochemical F and in human brain is actually related to depression, right? So there are FDA approved drugs that target serotonin system for therapeutic effects. And now we have those tools, so we, c we can look at fruit flies, mice, and we just for curiosity, we look at since it's simple, right? And for example, it's known that fruit flies also they learn, they remember, they can associate with some, you know, food food odor with some, you know, good approaching behaviors. And serotonin is in fruit flies is also very important. If you somehow eliminate serotonin, do not allow it to be secreted, they don't remember. Fruit fly don't remember. Mm. And now we have this unique tool, then we can just look at fruit fly's brain, try to understand this teeny tiny creature, why serotonin is important, where do they secrete, and how fast they secrete, yeah. secrete at which cells, and how does it relate to the learning ability this teeny tiny creature might have. And in hoping that our understanding might share lies of human physiology or disease in the future. We don't know yet, but at least it will just be interesting. It's I hope my, my student will be curious enough just to understand that. Yes. And then what how do you how do you do the the imaging of such faint light for something like a serotonin secretion in a fruit fly? How are you doing that imaging? Such a small creature. Again, uh, yeah, you should ask my students. They are the one doing the experiments. Uh, so uh, it's it's kind of challenging because fruit fly are so teeny tiny, right? So my students they figure out a way, and in fact, the other scientists also, you know, work on fruit flies. It's a pretty popular animal model organism, especially for genetics, uh, for development studies, because it's grow really fast and has a lot of gen available genetic tools. But for fruit flies, we sort of carefully anesthetize them and mount them using some non-invasive glue to mount them on certain um, paper or, you know, tin paper or something. And then we can put them under a very sophisticated microscope that people have been developing for years and this microscope that is called two photon microscope and this microscope has this unique ability that it can sort of using the longer wavelengths of light that it can read relative deeper into the brain just to see things okay and therefore we can just sort of uh, non-invasively now the fly are still alive and then you can still you know uh, give them different odors and if you see the their legs they are still sort of uh, uh, running and, and using long wave length of, l of the illumination light right the illumination more than light. a thousand nanometer light right yeah, our eyes cannot, cannot perceive yes, yes. right okay okay and then that can send you the imaging of what's right. happening right that you can sort of scan point by point and just collect those point by point, point signal together, you will have an imaging. And then you can also scan over time, that will create mm -hmm. movies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you bring the banana, you watch the neural activity, neural communication. Right. Yes, yes, okay. And I can see all of the interesting applicabilities and insights that that actually gives into our own neurophysiology and all the other um, creatures with nervous systems. What about your ideal tool. What would be your ideal neuroscience tool for 
achieving this desire for understanding neural communication? What would be a tool that you imagine as this epic pinnacle tool that could be so great for us? Well, I think, you know, if you think about tools in general, right, and the tools usually will be the tools that uh, allow us to manipulate things. There will also be tools that allow us to recall things. Okay, there will be these two general, general categories, right? So the nervous system is so complex, and uh, in a way, the idea too, uh, if I could think about, and again, people are trying to do that, but it's still not available yet. If you have an idea too uh, for animal studies, that you can simultaneously control, you know, a hundred different type of neurons activity using orthogonally, right? Don't interfere with each other. And then you also have the method can simultaneously reading out a hundred different type of neurons activity and knowing which type is which type orthogonally. Then this can really for understand how neuron compute this can provide a powerful tool because then you can reading out in the native condition what happened with those neuronal activities. You can read read out in the disease condition in the animal models what happened with different type of neurons. And then then picking out oh it's this type that went wrong, not the other one. And but that only provides you the correlations, right? Because you are just reading out the during this scene what happened. The, then the, the tools that can allow you simultaneously, computerally, not orthogonally control this 100 type of neurons activity, then you can really precisely just to perturb those neurons of interest. And then just try and use that to establish causality. And that would be the you know, uh, perfect tool to help to understand in the intact system those neuronal functions and you will have a long I think implications of understanding the disease causes and then provide therapeutic um, uh, approaches in the long run okay so uh, again this is gonna be challenging but this will be very useful and that being said for humans that will be even more challenging, right? Just because of the, you know, ethical issues, and then the, the, the it's just even more challenging to, to do that in humans. And uh, let, let me just lower the bar. Just if one can do that with the animal models, uh, including the human primates, and that will already be very useful for the uh, nervous systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that tool a lot, and. How about on a neural communication level of disease? Many people, especially cyberneticians, talk about how every disease that we experience is a disease of communication that's happening within the body. How do you, what do you feel about that statement? And then how do you feel about the onset of things like neurodegeneration related to m misfunctional neural communication? Uh, well, indeed, a lot of diseases are sort of uh, due to cell cell communication problems. Okay. In fact, if you look at the FDA approved drugs, they are about probably 40% to 50% are directly or indirectly targeting to this sort of protein receptor protein called GPCR, G protein couple receptors, which are sitting on the cell membrane, receiving the input from other cells, and then talk to the inner part of the cell, ask them to do things, okay? And the drugs currently available are targeting those surface receptors, 40 to 50 percent of them. And, and using them to give them some better instructions. Some of them are overactivated, you just, the drugs just 
keep them quiet. Some of them are weak activated the drugs just you know activate activate them in a better strength. And that provides the uh the therapeutic uh, uh uh value for a lot of patients. So just by that definition that probably about fifty percent of those diseases are really related to the cell cell communication, not just neurons, you know the 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 fat cells, the heart cells, they are also having those receptors and sensing the hormones. And uh, and then uh, and then uh, I think in that regard, there's also other opportunities to further sort of design drugs uh, and target those. Uh, protein for therapeutic purpose. For example, in human genome, there are probably around a hundred of those GPCRs are still open, meaning that they, we don't know why is their endogenous ligand, the physiological relevant ligand to activate them. And therefore, we have poor understanding of their function, even though for every sense of evidence, we could guess they are important, but we don't know what kind of sense they sense what is their physiological function and therefore you do not right now offer a really therapeutic target for drug development but with their fundamental research for example deorphanize and identify their physiological ligand and understand their partial physiological function they can provide more targets that again aiming at the receiving end all right, because those they are the, res the receptors receiving the ligand for therapeutic purpose, and we can also target at the signal sending end, right? Sending the, the information, right? You can prevent the uh, the cell to be overactivated, sending the wrong signal, or you can, you know, sort of boost sending of the signal. Uh, right now, uh, there are some drugs doing that, but still relative few, and. I think there are more opportunities in that regard. But probably it requires, especially for the nervous system, it requires our better understanding which cell is doing what. Because to really have a therapeutic effect, you want to boost the relevant signal communication and minimize this off-target effect. But right now, because of complexity of the nervous system only for the tip of iceberg subset of cells or brain regions we have some understanding of their physiology and pathophysiological roles and for the majority i would say more than 90 percent or 95 percent of the brain region and with specific cells we actually have no idea of their function we don't even know you know the blueprint the kinetomics of the human neurons yet because of it's just so complex and and so so there's still um, uh, requirements and incentives for for scientists and for the society with the governmental support private foundation support trying to sort of help us to understand the fundamentals the basic research in hoping to provide therapeutic more therapeutic uh, 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 interventions. I love that. That also ties us to that first thing that you said about the fundamental scientific research being done and it can help enable so much of the therapeutic effects that we so n want and need. What about neural prosthetics? I'm curious about what your thoughts are about that field and about jamming chips into our brains. What do you think about that? Well, I think it's a very unique and promising area, right? There's already FDA approved uh, uh, therapeutic approaches through deep brain stimulation for certain diseases. Mm -hmm. And and neuroprosthetics will be a, a better way uh, uh, to help to by integrate sensory information mm -hmm. and to feedback to the the, the, the neuron or specific type of neurons that, uh, that uh, for example, can could in principle enable 
at least to start with those disabled persons to have a better control of their lives yeah. and also has implications of you know uh, enhance the human uh, ability sports ability compact ability which might not be the direction we want to go creative ability uh, possibly uh, I think right now uh, I think it's promising but there are still quite based on why I know knowledge gap in a way how to really implement those things with uh, rationally design so for yes. example you can predict if you're doing this that it will have this beneficial value and I think this uh, um, is still a work in progress. Yes. Does it ever feel like we have a little way to figure out some of our uh, ethical or moral challenges first before jamming the chips into our brains? Of course we need to consider uh, for human studies this, this the ethical concern uh, or the ethical issues need to be well thought up and discussed. And uh, in fact, you know, since go through waves, for example, you know, just uh, as time from many years ago, when scientists first invent ways to generate recombinant DNA, there's already serious discussion about the implication of these techniques. And now with this genome editing, CRISPR-Cas system that uh, can have a higher efficiency to edit genes with will. This actually create is another wave, but it's actually same set of sort of ethical concern and rigor need to need to be exercised and need to be discussed. And yes. uh, and also uh, it's a uh, it's uh, I think it's not just for one country, and it's also uh, global international efforts yes. and it's challenging in a way that it also integrates with different cultural differences okay uh, so uh, well I'm not a clinical scientist working on human subject per se but uh, 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 at least right now for us working on animal models that uh, we have uh, less uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, concerns right now, but uh, for the therapeutic purpose, one of course need to think in advance. Mm -hmm. yeah, I like how you put it that this is important on a whole geopolitical, on a global level, and there are cultural differences that need to be accounted for, all of this type of stuff. The current state of our world, as you mentioned at the beginning, is going in the direction of prosperity, maximizing flourishing, me meeting the basic needs of people, all this type of stuff. Yet we have the most massive gap in wealth inequality ever. What do you think about that? Uh, wow, it's a big question. Uh, uh, let's see. Well, I think uh, some fundamental sort of uh, rights, for example, the rights to have a good education that might help in a way so to sort of uh, reduce this imbalance, okay? And, uh, you know, China, w for example, you know, just like many countries, including in the States, there's also huge regional differences. Right. Yeah. So, uh, for example, in China, uh, there's uh, usually along the coast are more economic development, and therefore are uh, having a good, a relatively good resources for education, you know, and uh, healthcare, healthcare, etc. And uh, in the in the uh, West countryside, and that that will be just less. But in terms of the education or as a fundamental right just to mm. to make it happen um, to everyone and with uh, with uh, guaranteed support I think that can help helped to reduce the 
uh, uh, the imbalance. And also, uh, modern technique-wise, right? So, for example, the 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 cell phone cell phones are being very popular in a way that has the internet connection, has a network, and. It, in China, it's been popular that can be used for almost every single thing. You know, Alipay, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, WeChatting. Mm -hmm. Implement the infrastructure sort of uh, relative equally, meaning that allow the access of cell phone signal in every single corner of the country will be useful for those less developed countries because then they have uh, access to the connected world mm. uh, to for information for education for you know uh, uh, convenient e-services mm -hmm. and the capital or sort of uh, sort of the uh, so sort of the economic value itself might not do it because of, you know, economic wise, uh, for the uh, cell phone company, it probably will be more uh, beneficial to install the, the cell phone towers in the dense population, dense regions, yeah. Yeah. Where, the, where economically it makes sense. And therefore, I think governmental or charity, private sectors in a way, trying to counter the pure economic drive, but sort of increase the basic infrastructure, the education rights to every corner. And I, and I mean to, uh, probably also not in China, uh, but in other countries, there's always this economic drive that to make profits that uh, based on, you know, developed country, uh, yeah. developed cities or certain generations, certain uh, uh, elite groups, but how to really implement the infrastructure that counter this profit-driven mm -hmm. market force, yes, I yes. think it will be uh, uh, important uh, to ensure the sort of the balance and the reduce of this huge uh, uh, gap uh, uh, for the different classes. Yeah, I like that answer a lot, figuring out how to democratize education around the world and how to create incentives for that democratization. I like that a lot. And <clears throat> with the explosion of exponential technologies that are happening right now, especially at your lab, this is really interesting. How do you and your students in the lab keep up with neurobiological research that's happening in China, in the United States, around the world. How do you keep up with all of the advances that are happening? Well, we use both, I would say, old-fashioned ways and also use new technology ways, right? So old-fashioned ways, well, we read papers. So the, the scientific publication are still the, probably one of the oldest way, but still a uh, very valuable way uh, to communicate your sort of ideas and your sort of uh, inventions. So we, we have our uh, regular journal clubs that we read sort of uh, uh, research articles uh, relevant to mm -hmm. our interest. Mm -hmm. We also attended uh, good research conferences mm -hmm. both in China and abroad, uh, including in the States. Society of Neuroscience meeting is probably the largest uh, meeting for the neuroscientists, and uh, we, fr we almost every year we went there, and more than three students that uh, from my lab uh, that, uh, they go there. We also use the social media, right? The, for example, um, WeChat has been popular in China, and there are some special in Chinese Gong Zhong Hao and there's a sort of a certain sort of a special group that uh, will collect some of those latest development. Mm. They sort of broadcast uh, through WeChat, and then we okay. can subscribe. Yeah. And also, there is uh, 
there's private sectors, there's some individual research groups. Um, for example, if they are in our own field, they also create their own private WeChat sort of uh, group that mm. they disseminate their journal club. Okay, their thoughts about certain paper, certain techniques, and we also join the discussion and sus subscribe that. And in fact, uh, we also embrace ourselves. For example, we use uh, bioarchive in a way to uh, sort of uh, review our pre-print pre research before its official sort of publication. So in a way that the scientists will have a early access to some of our research. And our that has a, a, a Twitter account that some students are managing, mm -hmm. uh, mainly for our research uh, discoveries. And, uh, and I'm also hoping to have a better investment of uh, sort of uh, our own website and have a mm -hmm. better updates mm -hmm. and uh, also with our own groups, Gong Zhong Hao. Uh, yeah. Some of my students, if they listen, please help me to do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I like the variety of, of uh, techniques and processes that, that you described there. And I'm happy to hear that there's these groups that are happening within things like WeChat where they're compressing the, the scientific discoveries and disseminating them through the platform to other people and getting more people engaged. I like that a lot. Also in this exponential technology age, what would be something, you have a child, six years old. Yes. Yes. And we have many people that have children. What is something that they can learn going into this exponential technology age that you think is a critical skill to learn? I, I wish, you know, he, he's not addicted to iPad, okay? <laughs> I think it's a little bit too much. So while, while, while we, meaning uh, me and my wife, what we are trying to do is actually get him into an old-fashioned way to read books. <laughs> so essentially what we are trying to do is counter this market force or this attractiveness of iPad with this colorful app, with this sound, with this cartoon but in a way, trying to get him to read books. Uh, honestly speaking, I don't have a good solution, okay? So, so right now, uh, what I'm really forcing in a way to balance like five minutes iPad equals five pages of book, s books. So, so he has to read five pages before he can ask for five minutes of iPad, but uh, probably uh, you know, I, I could get more advice from others. And um, it's been challenging for me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And there may be some sort of really interesting aspects to old principled ways of learning, like reading books that are just really critical to knowledge accumulation that we may not be able to get from iPads, but also vice versa, certain things that we can get from um, the newest technological revolutions that we couldn't get from the older technologies. Does it feel like... there's some sort of meaning to this big human experiment that we're all a part of on this planet, what is the meaning of it? I don't know. I, I don't think about a lot about that. But uh, from, you know, there, there are a lot of thoughts, right? Just looking at, not just human, right? Um, you know, there are thoughts that, you know, even as books called the self, selfish DNA, right? So, so one of the meaning, if you put it this way, as a creature, or as a biological species, uh, is we just been selected in a way that we need to pass, our, pass on our genetic materials to our offsprings, yeah. right? And uh, yeah, I probably should think more about that and you know, if I have less grad students to worry about, you know. <laughs> We have a a uh, a 
amount of, of uh, computational capacity that is now starting to become more and more able to do simulations, digital twins, all these kinds of things. Does it feel like we're in a simulation? Uh, again, I, 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 I don't think about this. Uh, I, I hope not. Uh, uh, w when I was reading or learning some simulation, usually the other part of my brain is how can I put this to help my students? <laughs> like, uh, or help our research projects that well we can using this computation power that has been generated, for example, including DeepMind, or they have this AlphaGo, mm -hmm. but also they have this AlphaFold, which is a, a program to help to try to predict protein structures. I probably put more thoughts of how to mm -hmm. use those mm -hmm. simulation instead of worrying about, you know, doing you know, artificial intelligence to do, to do evil things, but how to harness like alpha thought or similar programs mm. to provide uh, uh, predicting uh, 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 essays or predicting structures that can help our research or help our understanding of the brain. That's why I'm probably put more thoughts of that. Yes, yes. The creative capacity of super intelligence to run all of the permutations and find the ones that are most uh, relevant is so so important well i wish i could find one at least to solve <laughs> our structural biology problem okay <laughs> i you know i'm trying to learn a little bit myself but it's too challenging for me i'm too old does it feel like consciousness arises from the biological complexity does it feel like it comes from somewhere and takes the seat in the body. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. You know, just looking at again the neural system from, you know, if we define those different animal species, right? So you can look at the things from uh, sort of simple organisms like C. elegant, C. elegant worms or Drosophila. The a lot of uh, sort of fundamental neuronal connections at the two cell level might be the same, but of course the the uh, human beings or primates that uh, really have this expansion of this complexity that that enable a uh, more sophisticated uh, 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 control and at least correlated with higher cognitive function including you know depression happiness you know uh, you know all different emotions emphasis right so yeah, I, I think at least there's a good correlation, and the causality is always challenging to, to prove. What is the role of love in life? Well, I think it's to make people happier. Uh, you know, we have again. We have a six-year-old son from, uh, uh, from our family, and you know, he's for sure to the source of joy. Just you know, <laughs> even though fighting him not to get addicted to iPad, right? So it's you know, it's just really a source of joy. Just you know, seeing him, you know, making mistakes, you know, doing silly things, or you know, or really pretend to be an adult, to be a, a loving person and, you know, giving greetings, you know, it's, you know I think uh, the, the, in that regard, the, the love is just make people happy. Mm -hmm. And what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Well, uh, at least right now, uh, the center of gravity for me or my family is our son, okay? So the, with the kids, actually, you know, uh, 
I think uh, this is a special relationship and then just seeing and I think this is I think it is irreplaceable The selfish gene, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> procreation, <laughs> but it's also such a central source of love and and light and joy, and beauty. Yeah, well, this has been really fun. Thank All right. you. Well, good to talk to you. Yeah. All Thank right. You. Thank you so much for coming on our yeah. show. Sure. Thanks for bringing us out to Peking University. Greatly okay. appreciate it. Thank well, you. Well, I hope, s I hope, some of my students see or don't see. In either way, uh, I will be happy. If you see the show, please help me do something, okay? <laughs> if you don't, that's okay. I, I don't feel the embarrassment. <laughs> I love it. Thank you everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Have more conversations with your friends, families, coworkers, people online about neurobiology and about all these tools that we were describing today in the episode. Also support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the leaders around the world that you believe in. Support them, help them grow, support our show simulation. You can find all of our links below for support. And also check out the links in the bio to support yulongleelab.org, also the Twitter profile for the lab as well as Yulong's LinkedIn profile. And Go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Bye. Peace.